Welcome back. The specific heats for liquids and solids have made uh, a sufficient number of appearances in the, the videos that I've already posted, but we have yet to talk about heat capacities for gases. Notice I just said specific heats in reference to liquids and solids, but here I'm just saying heat capacities. Specific heat means per kilogram, but usually when it comes to gases, heat capacities are specified per mole. And this topic is a little more complicated than it is for solids and liquids because uh, you can use a, typically you can use a single value to describe the heat capacity, specific heat, um, for a solid over a very wide range of temperatures. Let's take water for instance, even, which is of course not necessarily a solid. Um, at five degrees Celsius, water is close to freezing. If you want to raise the temperature of that water by one degree, you're probably going to have to dump in 4,190 joules. If the water is up at 99 degrees, close to boiling, and you want to raise its temperature by one more degree, you can probably just dump in 4,190 uh, joules of energy. So that, that number doesn't change much over a very wide range of temperatures. But for gases, it, it can depend on the state of the gas. Uh, maybe it takes 2,000 joules to raise the temperature by one Kelvin when it's at a particular pressure and temperature, but at a very different position on the PV diagram, you might have to dump in a different amount of energy to get that same one degree increase. So it is more complicated. However, there are some, um, some specific simple processes for which we can examine or define the heat capacity, and those are constant volume and constant pressure. Here's a graphic from your book showing those two processes for an ideal gas. Keep in mind, this entire discussion in these chapters, it's, it almost always pertains to an ideal gas where we, we consider the particles as little hard spheres that only interact when they bang into each other. When they're at a distance, there's no interaction and no potential energy between them to speak of. Okay, we've got two different isotherms here. Remember, as you go away from the origin, you're, you're cutting through isotherms of greater and greater total thermal energy. So the gas at any state along this isotherm would have more thermal energy than it would down here because every point along this curve um, corresponds to a state with the same temperature. It's a constant temperature isotherm. And temperature is the only thing that determines the total thermal energy for an ideal gas. Remember, the higher the temperature, the faster those particles are zipping around on average. That means the greater their total kinetic energy. We don't have to worry about potential energy, so that's irrelevant. The higher the temperature, the greater the energy. Now there's, there's uh, two ways shown here for getting from the lower temperature uh, or the lower energy isotherm to the higher energy isotherm. I almost said lower energy state, but remember this state is considered to be different from this state. The state includes the values of all these state variables. The, uh, the pressure and volume here are different from the pressure and volume here. So they're two different states, but they share the same total energy, same temperature. Um, if we move across this horizontal curve, notice the pressure is not changing. That's an isobar, isobaric process. If we go straight up, the volume's not changing. That's an isochoric process. You could call this curve an isochore. So there is no work being done along an isochore because we have no change in volume. Let us now define uh, the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature from the temperature corresponding to this isotherm and the temperature corresponding to this isotherm for each of these different processes. For this process, the pressure doesn't change, but the temperature is still increasing, and it's going to take uh, an input of heat to do that. Uh, the amount of heat required to do that for Pardon me, I had a cough. I stopped the mic barely in time. Uh, the amount of heat required to raise the temperature from here to here whilst keeping the pressures constant, that amount of heat for one mole is going to be called the uh, constant pressure molar heat capacity. It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature by one degree for one mole of gas at constant pressure. And there's going to be a different amount of heat required to get the temperature from here to here. Again, same initial and final temperatures because it's the same isotherms, but it's, it's a different process. In this case, um, the, uh, the work done is zero, and we'll see that it's a different quantity of heat. So the amount of heat required 
to get the temperature change uh, accomplished for this process for one mole will be called the constant volume heat, uh, molar heat capacity. We'll define those two heat capacities just for these two specific processes for an ideal gas. Uh, if we're talking about constant volume, the heat required will be, this is how your book typically writes it, the, the number of moles times the number of joules required per mole. And we use a capital C rather than the lowercase c. That helps us distinguish between heat capacity, molar heat capacities for gases and specific heats for solids. In this case, for gas and a molar heat capacity, we use capital C. And the subscript emphasizes that we're talking about a constant volume process. And then, like usual, it's the delta T. So it's a lot like uh, the previous stuff we did with calorimetry. MCAT, MC delta T, has now become N. Because instead of requiring the heat, instead of specifying the heat required per kilogram, we're now specifying the heat required per mole. S same equation down here, but we use a subscript P to emphasize that the, the process is at constant pressure. So number of moles times the heat required per mole for constant pressure. It's really per mole per Kelvin times the number of Kelvins. Okay, same equation as calorimetry, but this time we're talking about gases and number of moles. Now we'll follow the same line of re uh, reasoning presented in your book. This is on page 533. Uh, we'd like to relate these two. Is there a relationship between CP and CV? Now keep in mind, these numbers should be different going from one gas to the next. You know, different atom or different diatomic molecule, uh, molecule should have different properties. But we'll see that the relation between them does not depend on the gas, which is kind of interesting. And later we'll see that what I just said, that the, these heat capacities may be different from one gas to the next. That may not even be true. True. Okay, for constant volume, You want to remember that the starting point for many things in these chapters is the first law of thermodynamics. When you took mechanics, the starting point very often was F equals MA. Well, now we'll, we'll start by saying that the change in thermal energy for a quantity of ideal gas, and first law is true for any system, really, not just an ideal gas, could be any gas. There's the, the heat that flows in to the gas that could raise its uh, internal energy or the work done on the gas that could also raise its internal energy. Now, for a constant volume process, remember, to do work on a gas, you have to compress it or allow it to expand, in which case the work done on the gas would be a negative number. But if there's no change in volume, you can't squeeze or allow it to expand, you're not doing any work on that gas. So you just want to memorize that for an isochoric process, no work is done. And we've just developed an expression here this is really the definition of the heat, molar heat capacity at constant volume. So we'll say that delta E thermal is NCV delta T. Now, this is um, out of order compared to the way your book presents it, but I'm going to take this opportunity right now to point out <clears throat> that this equation will give you the change in thermal energy of an ideal, ideal gas for any process. So I'm going to emphasize because this is going to, going to appear in future chapters. This works for any process, only for an ideal gas. And maybe I'll wait on the explanation, but the, the short answer is, remember, for an ideal gas, it, once you've specified the temperature, you've completely specified, well, assuming you know the number of moles. Once you've specified the temperature, you've specified the thermal energy. So it doesn't actually matter how you get from one temperature to the next. I'm going to go back to that graphic real quick. And remember, whether you took the isobaric process to go from this temperature to this temperature, or you took the isochoric process to go from this temperature to this temperature, the, the change in energy is the same in each case. So you, uh, if you're interested in the change in energy from here to here, for instance, you can actually pretend as if uh, that temperature change was accomplished along this path and calculate the change in energy using the constant volume uh, molar heat capacity, even though the process you took was not actually constant volume. That, that's a really important point. Try to cement that in your mind 
delta E thermal really just depends on the initial and final temperature. So you can use that constant volume definition of uh, molar heat capacity to calculate that change in energy. Moving on to the constant pressure process. We can still invoke the first law of thermodynamics, the diet plan law, as I call it. <clears throat> well, this time we can't cross out the work because you recall from a moment ago in that graph, the, the horizontal line representing an isobaric process, the volume is changing. So we can use our, um, our general expression for work. First, let me write down Q, the, the heat added in terms of uh, are using the definition of the constant pressure molar heat capacity. How come I can use this? Because by assumption, we're talking about a constant pressure process. So that would be the heat capacity at constant pressure. And now uh, I'll do the uh, negative integral of P dV from initial volume to final volume. Remember that? That's, that integral will out, is the most general way of specifying how to calculate the work done. But for a constant pressure process, remember, if P is constant, you can pull it out of the integral. And the integral of dV would just be V final minus V initial. But you know, that just means add up all the changes in volume that would give you the total change in volume. So minus P total change in volume. This is the, the first law of thermodynamics applied to a constant pressure process. And here's Here's where we tie it together now. <clears throat> Once again, we recognize that this change in energy should be the same for both processes. Um, we went through a different series of states in each case, but the, the total change in thermal energy is the same. And that's because the initial and final temperatures is, are the same. For the isobaric process, we may end up on a different part of the isotherm than we did using the constant volume process, but the temperature is still the same and hence the, the final energy is the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we'll set these equal to each other. And of course, what I'm going through here is in your book. So I'll say delta E thermal only depends on T initial and T final for an ideal gas. All right, and the rest is just algebra here. What, what can we do with this here? Well, if I want to relate CV to CP, I'd like to simplify this equation as much as possible and get rid of anything else that, that I'm not interested in. Let's use the ideal gas law to substitute for P. So we know that for an ideal gas, PV equals NRT. And then we can take the delta of both sides. Uh, we'll say for for constant N, I need to make this comma, because remember, this was, the, uh, this was the change in thermal energy for the isobaric process, isobaric, which means this is also constant. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna evaluate this for constant pressure. So I'll, I'll emphasize isobaric. Uh, we'll take the delta of both sides. We just ask ourselves, what's changing? P is not changing, only V is changing. N and R do not change, only T. So we're left with P delta V is equal to N R delta T. This is not true in general. This is only true for an ideal gas, for a process in which the pressure is constant. So up here, instead of writing P delta V, we could instead substitute this. Put that in right there. And I, now I can rewrite this equation. All right, minus N R delta T. Now we're getting somewhere because check it out. A couple things can be divided from the entire equation. The delta T's go away, the N's go away, and we're left with CP equals CV plus R. I would try to memorize that or at least be familiar with it. Throw that on your note card. The first, the first thing you should notice is it says that CP is greater than CV. If you wanna raise the temperature of a gas by one degree at um, constant pressure, you're gonna to have to dump in more heat 
than you would have to dump in if you were just raising the, the temperature at constant volume. And you can understand that physically. Suppose this is the quantity of gas you're talking about. You'd like to raise its temperature. What happens to the temperature, excuse me, what happens to the pressure as you raise the temperature if this volume is not allowed to change? So forget about this outer boundary. Look at this inner boundary. If you heat these particles up, don't they immediately start to bounce around faster, which means they hit the walls of their container harder? That would mean the pressure would go up. So if you want to raise the temperature of these without having the pressure go up, in other words, at, uh, while keeping the pressure constant, you're going to have to compensate by increasing the volume. So allow the volume to expand so that even though the particles are zipping, zipping around faster and they're hitting the walls harder, they're hitting the walls slightly less, less often. Those two effects will balance out and the pressure remains the same. Well, don't forget that when a, when a gas expands, it's doing work on its surroundings. These outward arrows, just imagine, you know, you're, you're trapped inside this boundary and you're using your hands, you're using your hands to push outward on the boundary. You can sense that you'd be doing work on your surroundings. So the point is that some of the heat that's being dumped into the interior in order to raise the temperature, some of that heat is being used to do work on the surroundings. And I'm being a little imprecise with my language here, but that heat corresponds to energy, or that heat is energy. Some of the energy that you're dumping in as heat is being used to do work on the surroundings. So you're gonna to have to put even more in than you would at constant volume. If, if this is your constant volume box of particles and you wanna have heat flow in to raise the temperature, none of that energy that you're putting in as heat is being used to do work. It's all going to an increase in thermal energy. So you don't have to put in as much per degree. That's the basic idea. But try to remember the relationship here. And also remember, this is 8.31 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Also introduce now uh, the ratio of these two heat capacities. And before I do that, it might be worth pointing out that if you just subtract the two, you get R. It's another useful relationship. The difference between those two heat capacities is this universal gas constant. That's kind of interesting. Now let's define the, the ratio, well, not really defined because we know what a ratio is, ratio of heat capacities, molar heat capacities. And this is for an ideal gas. Constant pressure compared to constant volume. Well, remember, this is always greater than this. So we know that this ratio is greater than one. Well, that would be CV plus R over CV. I'm using the relationship here. Let's distribute. We've got one plus R over CV. And many books use the Greek letter gamma for that. So gamma is the ratio of heat capacities. And now check this out. R compared to CV is gamma minus one. And at this point, this is too many formulas to memorize, right? If you just have the basic relationships memorized, you can get the rest of these. You have to remember that gamma is the ratio of the two. But I'm gonna put a box around that because this quantity is gonna show up in a moment as well. The ratio of universal gas constant to the constant volume heat capacity, that's what we call gamma minus one. Now this ratio takes on a different value depending on whether you're talking about a monatomic ideal gas. That's where every particle is simply an atom, like uh, an atom of neon. That's one of the noble gases. It doesn't bond with itself to form a uh, diatomic molecule. Uh, as opposed to the common diatomic gases that are present in the air, we breathe nitrogen, oxygen. I believe hydrogen is also um, a diatomic gas, but not sure about that. It, it might be worth memorizing these, but they're also in a table. You're gonna use these quite a bit. Anytime you're doing a homework problem or an exam problem involving air or one of those common diatomic gases, this is the number to remember. Now, these two numbers are suspiciously close to five-thirds and seven-fifths. You can check that in your calculator, and that's no coincidence. In fact, we're gonna show why this relationship or why that coincidence is not really a coincidence. And that will actually make it easier to remember these two values because 
five is uh, the next highest odd integer after three, same thing for seven compared to five. That's gonna help us remember things and we'll actually be able to show where these integers come from. There's a very good explanation for that. And that's one of the great things about these chapters is the explanation really helps you um, feel it in your bones that atoms exist, that matter is made of atoms, because otherwise all this behavior we're able to explain would just be some grand coincidence. And now we're ready to look at a so-called adiabatic, not diabetic, adiabatic process for an ideal gas. We've already looked at a number of simple processes where one of the variables remains constant. We've looked at isochoric, that's constant volume, isobaric, constant pressure, uh, isothermal, constant temperature, where the energy doesn't change, and now, lastly, I, uh, adiabatic, which is another very common process. And the definition is simple. It's where the heat transfer between your gas and its surroundings is zero. So in the first law of thermodynamics, the energy, the change in thermal energy of your ideal gas comes from two places. There's heat flowing in or, in or out, there's work being done on or by the gas. And if there's no heat flow, then it simply means that whatever work is done on the gas, that's the change in thermal energy. The only way to change an ideal gas's thermal energy in an adiabatic process would be to do work on it. There's no heat. And there's really just two scenarios that you have to remember. Why would a process be adiabatic? Well, either Either your ideal gas is insulated from its surroundings so that it's not possible for heat to flow. Think of an extremely well insulated uh, thermos, although you can't do work with the thermos because um, just think of, um, well, I should have prepared. I'll come back with that. So it's either there's no heat flow because of insulation or it's also possible that, that the process happens so rapidly that there isn't time for heat to flow. So heat doesn't flow instantly, right? When you put the, uh, when you put a, an iron pan on the stove, eventually you probably don't want to touch the handle directly. You don't want to grab the handle. If, the, if it's a cast iron pan that's been sitting there for 10 minutes, it's going to be too hot to touch. But when you first turn on the flame, even though the bottom of the pan might be hot already, it's perfectly safe to touch the handle because it takes a while for that heat to flow. And the same is true for gases. Uh, there is a time required for heat to flow. So if, if your expansion or compression is rapid, then you can argue that there's no time for heat to flow, and that would be approximately an adiabatic process. So there are a, two equations presented by your book that you can use for adiabatic ideal gas processes. I'm just gonna quote them. You've got the PV to the gamma is constant. This is on page 535. Uh, this may be the most convenient equation to apply depending on which variables you're given in the problem or using the ideal gas law remember PV equals NRT you could solve for P or you could solve for V using this and instead express this result not in terms of P and V but in terms of T and V and that would look like this TV to the gamma minus one is constant and I'll rem uh, remind you gamma pause on accident I'll remind you that gamma minus one is this quantity r over cv so we may we may see that pop up in our derivation now have we exhausted all possibilities for the state variables we've got p and v t and v what about t and p tp that's so relevant during this uh pandemic you could also express an adiabatic process using t and p that might be the most convenient way but i guess these are the two that come up more often in problems so get let, let's get right to showing this result, and your book does this with differentials on page 536. I'm going to do it basically the same way, but using, um, I'll eliminate a different variable. So we start from this equation. We start with the recognition that the change in thermal energy is the work done. But we'll use differential notation. So remember, for a, for a tiny little expansion, dV, rather than call it delta V, we call it dV, then the change in thermal energy would be dE. That still means change in thermal energy, but the idea is that it's a very small change. And the work done, instead of W, we'll call it dW. And some books don't like to do that because, remember, work is not 
some function that you can integrate. It's, it's energy in transit between two objects, but it's, it doesn't represent some total quantity that you can differentiate or integrate, but let's not worry about that. And we'll just use our general expression for the tiny amount of work done for a tiny expansion or compression. That's negative P dV. This is always true. It doesn't have to just be an adiabatic process. And then remember, even though we're, we're not talking necessarily about a constant volume process, you can always pretend that you went from initial to final temperature by a constant volume process because the change in energy is the same in each case. So we can use this, NCV dt. Again, you didn't necessarily take your gas through a constant volume process. In fact, for an adiabatic process, we know it's not constant volume. It's a different curve on the PV diagram, but the delta E is the same. So we can use the, res uh, the definition of heat capacity at constant volume to calculate that delta E. That's, you know, that, that's really what we need to finish this process here. Okay, and now we have to ask ourselves which pair of variables we're interested in relating for an adiabatic process. Do I want to develop this one or do I want to develop this one? Your book goes straight to this one and then they solve for this one. I'm going to go, I'm going to go straight to this one. So I'd like to develop an expression with only P and V in it. By the way, this was supposed to be a lowercase p. Okay, here I've got P's, V's, and T's. I need to get rid of this DT. So I'll start with saying, okay, from the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. Now, do you remember in a previous video, I talked about taking the differential of this equation. You can imagine that all three state variables, pressure, volume, and temperature, depend on some fourth quantity, like the total energy or entropy or whatever it is. And, and you're gonna tweak that, that parameter, and then as a result, all of these are going to change. So you could take the derivative of the whole equation with respect to that fourth parameter, and then at the end, divide out that, the, the differential of that parameter. But you've seen this in calculus. I'm gonna go straight to PDV plus DPV. I, I apply the product rule to the left side. And over here, closed system, N is constant. We just have N, R, D, T. Now, Here's what I'm going to do. This, this differential of the ideal gas law allows me to express dt in terms of these other differentials. I'm gonna plug that in here to get rid of the dt. And notice that uh, what I'd like to have is ncv dt. And over here I have nr dt. So let's multiply the whole equation by cv over r, which would give me what I want on the right side. So over here I've got cv over r, times PDV plus DPV. And on the right side, the R is canceled, and I have NCV DT. Great, because now I've got what I want. I'm gonna take the left side of the equation here and plug it in right there. CV over R, PDV plus DPV equals negative PDV. Now we're getting somewhere because this equation only has two of the state variables, pressure and volume. That's what I'm going for. So we're gonna recover this from all of this. Do you see how I've got a PDV here and a PDV here? That's fun to say, PDV. Let's put all the PDVs together. So I'll subtract this from both sides and I'm left with C over V or CV over R DPV equals, and I'll factor out a negative PDV it looks like I've got a one plus CV over R P D V. See that the first, when I distribute, the first term recovers this, the second term recovers this. Now, I'd like to just have V D P on the left side. So let's multiply the whole equation by R over CV to get rid of this. And I'm left with V dp equals, and maybe you would have preferred that I write this on both sides, but you get what I'm doing here. Let's multiply this by the right side, and I would looks like I would wind up with uh, r over cv plus. Now this times that is one. Aha, one plus r over cv. Wasn't this gamma minus one? Let me find that on the page. 
Let that go. Yes. No, that's just gamma. Excuse me, that's just gamma. One plus, one plus R. Yes, I'm going around in circles here. This is gamma minus one. So gamma minus one plus one is gamma. Right. Let's just recognize this whole thing as gamma. One plus R over CV is gamma. So what I've really got is V dP equals negative gamma P dV. And we're just about done here. Let's put all the P's on one side and the V's on the others. I think they call that separation of variables in uh, ordinary differential equations. So it looks to me like I would have a dP over P equals negative gamma dV over V. The rest is trivial. Remember, this is a constant. Let's integrate both sides. And here, since I'm integrating with respect to pressure, my limits would have to be pressure initial, pressure final. Here, I'd have volume initial, volume final. That volume corresponds to that pressure, same for initial. What's the antiderivative of 1 over P with respect to P? Natural log. So we've got the natural log. You know, you'd have ln of P final minus ln of P initial. Use that property where the difference in two logs is the log of their quotient. So I've got the log of final pressure over initial pressure. And this, you know, this isn't a negative num number under any circumstances, so we can take the log, that's fine. Here we've got negative gamma log, same, same device, V final over V initial. And then we'll use that property of logs. Let's take, let's take this, which is a constant out in front of the log and make it an exponent. So ln of P final over P initial equals the natural log of, well, over here I'm going to say V final over V initial to the negative gamma. The negative power, can't you just use that to you know, take the reciprocal? So that would be V initial over V final to the gamma. I'm using... Uh, just properties of exponents there. So I'll make this number out front, the exponent, and then it's gone from the front. And I really just have V initial over V final to the gamma power. So remember, we're, what this means is, if you were to put this into the calculator, you would do the exponentiation first, or, or raise it to the gamma power first, then take the natural law. Okay, the last thing is, as I like to say it, because I used to awkwardly try to put this into words, let's exponentiate both sides e to the ln of all that garbage is e to the ln of all that garbage. And of course, e to the ln of x, under most circumstances, is just x. Okay, so we've, we've gotten rid of the natural log, and now we have p final over p initial equals v initial over v final to the gamma. Let's move the, the v's over to the p's and the p's over to the v's. So we have final on one side, initial on the other, and here it is, p final v final to the gamma equals p initial v initial to the gamma that was the equation one of the equations that we should set out to show because initial and final could be any two states of your gas and that means any at any point along your adiabatic curve this would just have to be constant so an adiabat um, i'm writing adiabatic here but you could use the word adiabat to, to describe the adiabatic curve on the PV diagram. Okay, your book takes that and they turn it into the related formula. I think on the back side here. Yeah, we've, we've just shown this one. You can use the ideal gas law to turn that one into this one. So use one of these two equations to solve uh, problems involving adiabatic processes for ideal gases. Now, the problem you're doing could involve not this pair or this pair of variables. It could also involve T and P. And we, I don't have a third formula here for T and P in an adiabatic process, but you could derive it using the ideal gas law. What does an adiabatic process look like on a PV diagram or PV graph? It's not a hyperbola. In fact, an adiabat cuts across the uh, hyperbolic or the hyperbola that represent the isotherms. So you should try to remember that they are, are steeper than the isotherm. As you compress a gas adiabatically or allow it to expand adiabatically, it's gonna rise 
or fall more sharply than an isotherm. And that makes sense because let's look at this top curve here, the top adiabatic curve. If you're compressing something rapidly so that there's no time for heat to be transferred, um, normally when you, if you were to squeeze a gas, if you, if you allow that gas to stay at constant temperature, you would need heat to be leaving. You know what, let me, um, let me pause here. If, when you compress a gas, you have a tendency to make those particles speed up. You're doing work on the particles, so you would be making them all zip around faster. That would tend to, to increase its temperature. So if you want to compress something at constant temperature, you have to allow heat to flow out to compensate for the fact that you're dumping energy in by doing work. So an isotherm requires heat to be flowing out of the gas as you're compressing it. But if it's not possible for heat to flow out, then as you compress the gas, you should be raising its total internal energy. In other words, its temperature should be going up. And that's what we're seeing here. In this adiabatic compression, we're cutting across isotherms. We're going through isotherms of higher and higher temperature because that's what's happening inside. The temperature is increasing as we do work on the part of, or on the, the quantity of ideal gas. So just keep in mind that the adiabats have a particular shape. Um, I don't know the name for that that curve, maybe it doesn't have a name. I mean, if there is a name, it probably comes from thermodynamics and it would just be called an adiabatic curve. But it's defined by, on the PV diagram, it's de defined by PV to the gamma equals constant. Just a word about the math there. For a constant temperature, or in other words, constant thermal energy process, Remember PV equals nRT. If the temperature is constant, then PV is a constant, and P would just be some, I'm calling it alpha, some number alpha over V. And we've already looked at the fact that this graphs as a, um, a hyperbola, those so-called rectangular hyperboles, hyperbolas, hyperbole. Uh, there's that other word from, from literature, right? Hyperbola. I get those confused sometimes when I'm talking. PV to the gamma equals constant, on the other hand, what if I call that alpha? That, that would be P equals alpha over V to the gamma. That is not a hyperbola. It might look a little bit like it, but it's not a hyperbola. It's an adiabatic curve. It's not really necessary to think in these terms to do problems. It's more about using these two. You can watch more of this yourself, of course, but I, I put this uh, Veritasium link on Canvas here. Uh, they put a little piece of cotton, I think, into a, a cylinder, and this person's gonna rapidly, or the host is gonna rapidly compress the gas quickly enough that there's, there's really no time for any significant thermal energy to be exchanged between the outside air and the air inside the cylinder, because this is plastic that doesn't conduct heat very well. So you're gonna have a, a process on the PVD, PV diagram that doesn't allow for any heat to flow in and out. That would be an adiabatic process, and we expect that during that compression, uh, the, the adiabatic curve should cut across many isotherms. In other words, go up to a higher temperature and it could be hot enough to ignite a piece of cotton. Less amounts of temperature from a very quick compression. Three, two, one. Oh, surprise. Beginner's it's luck. luck. Yeah. yeah, check that out. So I guess we could generalize. I'm sorry, I cut him off and he was about to say something interesting. It's luck. Yeah. yeah, check that out. So I guess we could generalize and say, if you do the compression quite slowly, then, well, there's time for the heat to escape out of the air. And so we don't actually get a high, high enough temperature to cause the cotton to ignite. Okay, and an adiabatic compression would be much like what happens inside the cylinders of a of an internal combustion engine. You've got that air fuel mixture that's injected into the cylinders and in a four stroke engine, there's the uh, compression stroke, which is basically an adiabatic process. It happens because, you know, if you look at the RPM meter on the dashboard, those cylinders might be going at two, 3,000 revolutions per minute. That's, that's a, a very short amount of time per, per stroke, not enough time for heat to flow in and out of the walls of the cylinder adiabatic process, you would expect a very rapid increase in temperature, which is what you need to make the fuel ignite 
well, that's true for a diesel engine. In, in the cars that most of us drive, we use the, the spark plugs to ignite the air fuel mixture. This is probably done within the chapter, but I just Googled very quickly the compression ratio for a typical internal combustion engine, uh, that the volume of uh, air and fuel mixture within each, uh, each cylinder of your engine, you know, by how much is that compressed during the compression stroke. And I'm finding here for diesel engines, it could be anywhere from 14 to one to 25 to one. Uh, that compression ratio would be lower for, the, for a regular automobile engine that uses spark plugs because it's not necessary to get such a large temperature increase when you have a spark plug. You can just use the spark to ignite the air fuel mixture. And off to the side, if they're showing a comparison on the PV diagram, you'll, you'll note, between the so-called diesel cycle and the auto cycle. And I would, look, I would like to look at both of these in a future chapter. So a lot of what we're doing in these first two chapters is developing a vocabulary and some, some basic conceptual understanding that we can use to understand more interesting things like at the thermodynamics of the, uh, the cycle that, uh, that's happening in the engine of a car, you know, something that, that we take for granted every day. Isn't it funny that, um, that some guy named Otto, O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, probably was the first person to uh, study this cycle used by an automobile engine. It's just a weird coincidence. It's kind of like the pointing vector, right? Uh, that uh, their contribution to physics just coincidentally involves a word that matches their name. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just, let's take an average compression ratio of 20 to one and see how much the temperature skyrockets uh, during an adiabatic compression. And before we do that, here's a nice little animation from Wikipedia showing the, the four stroke engine. This is what's going on in each cylinder of your car engine. Also, if you've got a, a four stroke lawnmower or trimmer, same sort of thing inside. So you can see the, the gas, really it's an air fuel mixture being compressed. It's kind of fun to stare at these. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this stuff. Let's model the compression stroke in a four cycle engine as an adiabatic process. Since, since it's so rapid, there shouldn't be much opportunity for heat to flow in and out. And I'll go with the compression ratio of 20 to one. So the final volume uh, at the, what is it? The, at the end of the compression stroke would be 1 20th of the initial volume. And let's go with an initial temperature. Uh, you know, if you're driving outside in the cold air, you might go with zero degrees, but that air has already warmed to some extent as it enters the engine. So we'll go with 20 degrees or room temperature, and you have to use absolute temperatures. So remember, we, we derived these relationships using the ideal gas law, so it must be the absolute temperature. So add 273, we'll go with 293 kelvins, and I'd like to find the final temperature. How hot is that air-fuel mixture? Is it going to be hot enough to spontaneously combust without a spark plug? Well, the, the most convenient relationship to use, of course, would be the one with the T's and the V's, which I think was T V to the gamma minus one. The PV just has gamma. Okay, so that means T initial, V initial to the gamma minus one is T final, V final to the gamma minus one. I'm interested in T final. So all we have to do is take the initial temperature and multiply it by this ratio to the gamma minus one. Now, V final is 1 20th of V initial. So here we've got the reciprocal ratio. The initial volume is 20 times the final volume. So we're talking about a temperature of 293 multiplied by the number 20 to the gamma minus one. Well, what is gamma minus one? Recall for, um, off to the side here, for diatomic gases, gamma is 1.40. Gamma is the ratio of the molar heat capacities. I'm gonna go with this diatomic ratio because the air fuel mixture, well, most of the air is nitrogen. There's also oxygen. They're all diatomic gases. So even though it's not a single, Ideal gas, it's a mixture of ideal gases, which should behave like, or it's a mixture of near ideal gases. Obviously there's, there's fuel diffused in there as well, and we're not accounting for that. So this is an approximation, but it'll give us some idea of how hot this all gets. So 1.4 minus one, we just raise it to the 0.4 
power. And then at the end, we'll convert back into Celsius. So what is 20 raised to the 0.4 power? Okay, times 293. 971 kelvins. Let's let's subtract the 273, and that's roughly 700 degrees Celsius. I don't know what temperature at which uh, I don't know the temperature at which gasoline spontaneously combusts, but I'm guessing it's lower than that. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at number 64 from your homework, which I'd like to work right now, and realizing that is one of the problems where you need to know how T and P relate for an adiabatic process. So I'd like to, to develop a third equation just for the purpose of this problem here. Um, what can we, how can we do this here? Let's, uh, let's solve this for the ratio of the volumes in terms of the ratio of the temperatures. If T V to the gamma minus one is a constant, that would mean that T initial, V initial to the gamma minus one equals T final, V final to the gamma minus one. So V final over V initial to the gamma minus one. That would be the same as T initial over T final, just to the first power. And I need to turn this ratio, uh, I need to turn its exponent into just gamma so that I can substitute in here. So what I can do is raise both sides of this equation to gamma over gamma minus one. I'm having fun with exponents here. That way, uh, you know, when you raise power to a power and you multiply the powers, these will give just one. They'll cancel, so to speak. And we'll have V final over V initial to the gamma power equals T initial over T final to the gamma over a gamma minus one. Great. Okay, so we can take, uh, instead of writing this ratio to the gamma power, I'll go back here. Since uh, P initial V initial to the gamma equals P final, V final to the gamma. Let me solve this for V final over V initial to the gamma. V final over V initial to the gamma power equals P initial over P final. Right. And here's where we can substitute this into here. Because that's the same as V final over V initial to the gamma. So it looks like we've got T initial over T final to the gamma over gamma minus one equals P initial over P final. Well, I think we could make this a little simpler. Uh, in number 64, I'm looking ahead here, they're going to ask for the temperature. So I'd like to have just temperature to the first power, and that means uh, let's raise this whole thing once again to gamma minus one over gamma to cancel all of that. And I imagine there was a better way to do this, a more uh, concise way of doing this algebra, but what we're left with here, I'll write it off in the corner, is T initial over T final equals, uh, I could distribute the gamma, but I'll just leave it like that, P initial over P final to the gamma minus one over gamma. And that actually sounds familiar. I, I believe I did that correctly. So I'll set this off to the side. I'm going to use this in number problem number 64 in chapter 19. Okay, firstly, they tell us that we've got 14 grams of nitrogen. So the mass, capital M, is 14 grams, nitrogen two. Well, remember, a nitrogen atom has seven protons. That's what makes it nitrogen, and typically seven neutrons. That's 14 atomic mass units. But the molecule, the diatomic molecule, would then have 28. So the, uh, the number of moles here would be total mass divided by the mass per mole, 14 grams. And 28 nucleons means a mole has a mass of 28 grams. 28 grams per mole. So now we know how many moles we're talking about. Half a mole, 0.5. And we're given that the uh, gas originally is at, I'm sorry about the jiggling here. The gas is originally at standard temperature and pressure. Temperature is zero degrees Celsius, that's 273. 
kelvins and one atmosphere of pressure. And, and then this thing is compressed adiabatically until the pressure shoots all the way up to 20 atmospheres. So we're told that the pi, uh, final pressure is 20 atmospheres. And what they're asking for in part A is the final temperature. We know the initial temperature. What's the final temperature? So we've got, we're dealing with T and P. This is one of those problems where you'd like to relate T and P. I think they left this formula off of the list just because of the, the gnarly looking exponent. The, uh, the first two are simpler to look at. But once you've got it, it's easiest just to use that directly. I'm interested in the final temperature. So why don't I just take the reciprocal of this equation and, and then I'll move T initial over. So I find that T final would be a T initial times pressure final over pressure initial to the gamma minus one over gamma. And now this is trivial because I'll plug in the, remember, absolute temperature. It's gotta be absolute or this doesn't work. 273, that's uh, zero degrees Celsius was the original temperature at standard STP. And then I don't need to actually convert to uh, kilopascals, do I? Because we're, we're only dealing with the ratio. The final pressure is 20. So we're dealing with the ratio of 20 to one. Much simpler. Now, gamma minus one. Again, we're talking about nitrogen, which is a diatomic gas, and you can confirm from the table that the ratio of uh, molar heat capacities for a diatomic gas is 1.4. So subtract one, and we've actually got 0.4 over 1.4. Let me uh, calculate that exponent first. 0.4 divided by 1.4. There's the exponent. I'll put that into memory. I'll take the number 20 and raise it to that power and then I will multiply by 273. Oh, come on. Uh, 20 raised to the whatever that is times 273 kelvins. Okay, so I find a final temperature of 642 and a half degrees Celsius, uh, uh, kelvins, and that's the same as 369 and a half degrees Celsius. Makes sense, right? If the pressure went up, the temperature probably went up as well, or it most definitely went up. Same answer as your book, I'm observing. They rounded it to 643. And part B, how much work is done? Okay, let's invoke the thirst, first law, the thirst law, first law of thermodynamics. Uh, what's the work done? Well, in an adiabatic process, no heat is transferred. So if we could somehow calculate the increase in the thermal energy of this gas, that would be the same as the work. And we, there's no need to actually calculate the work integral. Now, could we do this? That would be interesting. Is it possible to do this? Uh, you know what? I think I might come back and do that. We would have to express the pressure in terms of the volume using this relation for, you know, the, where did it go? The one I just, Quoted the PV to the gamma rule. Yeah, we could probably do that, and then we would actually be able to integrate it. P is equal to some constant over V to the gamma. The thing is, we need to know what the uh, what that constant is, and I'd have to think about that. So I think I'll come back to that. Uh, it would be interesting interesting to see if we can calculate the work in that manner. But for now, let's just use this because remember whether or not. The, the gas process was constant volume. You can still use the constant volume heat capacity to calculate the change in thermal energy. So for, for an isochoric process, no work is done. And I'm so sorry about this. And the change in thermal energy, if no work is done, it would only be the heat. And that would be number of moles, heat capacity, constant volume times delta T. Well, we've already calculated there's half of a mole. And for the constant volume heat capacity for a diatomic gas, you'd have to look this up in a table. I'm quoting the result is 20.8 20 joules per mole per Kelvin. So have that table accessible. And then as far as the temperature difference, well, we go all the way up to, I'm going to round now. We go up to 643, finally, and we began at 273. So the delta T was 370. Kelvins. 
and we see that the units all cancel and joules should come out. So half a mole times 20.8 joules per mole per Kelvin times 370 Kelvins. Okay, so almost one food calorie of energy. Remember, this process, this adiabatic process is not constant volume, but the, the increase in energy for that adiabatic process will be the same as if you took your gas on a constant volume process between the same initial and final temperature. So we can go ahead and use the applicable formula for a constant volume process and get, get the uh, correct value for the energy. Part C is trivial. What's the heat transfer? Well, that's the whole point of an adiabatic process. There is no heat transfer. That was my favorite part of the problem. And D, what's the compression ratio? Well, let's use this one. Let's use the fact that PV to the gamma is constant. And I'm gonna to try to do this, do this in my head. I find after rearranging that the ratio of the volumes should be the reciprocal ratio of the pressures to raised to the one over gamma power. Well, gamma is 1.4, so you can find that exponent first. And I ended up finding that the final volume would have to be this many cubic meters. That's 0 0.001318. And in order to do that, I had to know what the initial volume was. And I realizing I'm doing this out of order because I didn't actually calculate that during this, this video. So over here, I rearranged the ideal gas law for volume, NRT over pressure. So plug in all these initial values, half a mole, 8.31, 273 Kelvins, and then atmospheric pressure in Pascals. And I find uh, this many cubic meters initially. So if I multiply by 1,000, that would be 11.2 liters. Take that, plug it in uh, to this equation to find the final volume. So, uh, I mean, since they were actually asking for the volume ratio, I could have just evaluated uh, the pressures. Yeah, what I actually did was get a, a value for the final volume. But if you just want the ratio, uh, let's, let's see here. I'm gonna take one over gamma, one divided by 1.4. So that's my exponent, I'll store that in memory. The initial pressure was 1 20th of the final pressure. So one divided by 20, I'll raise that to the, uh, the power there. And I find that this is the ratio of the volumes. If I take the reciprocal of that, it says that the initial volume is eight and a half times the final volume. V initial compared to V final would be eight and a half as listed in your solutions manual. Now, lastly, they're asking you to draw the process on a PV diagram. I'm just gonna quote the result from the solutions manual. We know that the result, or that the path, uh, the curve of an adiabat on a PV diagram swoops upward. It looks a little bit like a hyperbola, it's not a hyperbola. So we start up here at 11.2 liters, I think it was. It's compressed by a factor of eight and a half all the way down to whatever that final volume is. And we know that the pressure jumps from one atmosphere up to 20. So that's the most basic part, perhaps, of the solution. And here's the last thing I tried to do. I was not able to figure this out. Maybe one of you will catch my mistake. I wanted to calculate the work integral directly and confirm this number. We found that the, uh, this is the number of joules of work that were done, and we found that indirectly using the first law of thermodynamics. I was not able to get this number. Here's what I did. First, um, I wanted to figure out what is the constant to which PV to the gamma is equal. We know that for an adiabatic process, PV to the gamma is always just the same number. So what I first did was evaluate that number at the initial configuration, half a mole, 8.31, 273. Uh, yeah, what am I doing here? I use the ideal gas law first to solve for pressure. Pressure would be NRT over V, right? So this is pressure times V to the gamma. If you simplify, you still have an NRT, and then V to the gamma over V is V to the gamma minus one. So plug everything in here, as I've done. The initial volume, uh, we already calculated down here. Gamma minus one is 0.4. I find that PV to the gamma throughout the adiabatic process is equal to a constant value of 188. So if, if this right here is equal to 188, solve for pressure, and you would find that it's 188 times V to the negative gamma. This is how the pressure depends on the volume for this particular adiabatic process. So when it, 
when it uh, comes time to do the integral, instead of p, I can plop in this expression, pull out the constant, and I'm integrating v to the negative gamma with respect to v. And I, I naively thought that I could just use the power rule because what is the exponent here? Negative 1.4. I thought that the integral or antiderivative of v to the negative 1.4 would be v to the negative 0.4, right? Just raise the power by one as I've done here, negative 1.4 plus one would be negative 0.4. And I evaluated that at my upper and lower limits. And two things surprised me. Number one, the absolute value is not the number I expected. And there's a minus sign. Since the gas is being compressed, I know that that's positive work. So why am I getting a negative number? I hope that one of you can figure out what I've done wrong here. Maybe I'm, I'm uh, making an improper use of the power rule. This could be a calculus issue that I've forgotten since it's been a while since I've studied that subject in depth. And if, if you think of something, please let me know.